Let's start. Good evening and welcome to celebrate the first Worldwide Quantum Day. My name is Ulrich Bleier, member of the executive board of the German Physical Society for Public Relations. First time, the 14th of April is dedicated to discussing the problems and the success of quantum science and technology that started more than 100 years ago. We all know that every year the 14th of March is dedicated to a famous number in mathematics because the first digits are 3.14. The 14th of April is a reference to a fundamental number in physics introduced by Max Planck, the famous elementary action quantum H. 4.14 are the rounded first digits of Planck's constant as shown on the chart. The elementary action quantum was introduced by Planck already in 1900, exactly 100 years ago in 1922. The famous experiment of Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach opened the window to the internal dynamics of atoms. In 1925, Werner Heisenberg developed a quantum mechanics that offered first time the possibility to calculate quantum effects. But 100 years of quantum is just the beginning. With this expectation, numerous physical societies around the world started to prepare celebrating in 2025 the creation of quantum physics about 100 years ago. And most importantly, its relevance for today's science, technology, and societies. The aim is to organize an international year of quantum science and technology. But today and every year in the future, the World Quantum Day aims at engaging the general public in the understanding and discussion of quantum science and technology, namely how it helps us understand nature at its most fundamental level, how it helped us develop technologies that are crucial for our life today, and how it can lead to future scientific and technological revolutions and how these can impact our society. To do this, we invited you all to this meeting. Our round table discussion assembles pioneers that have taken quantum pro processes from the Gedanken experiment to the real world with young scientists in order to stimulate the reception of quantum science within and beyond the scientific community. A warm welcome to Serge Haroche, to Anton Seilinger, to Doris Reiter and Arno Rauschenbeutel. Many thanks for taking part in this meeting. We see more than 600 visitors of our live stream. Thank you all for joining us. Before starting, let me also thank the colleagues from the German Physical Society for the organization of this event. Let us now turn to physics. Our round table will be directed by Arno Rauschenbeutel. He is a very successful researcher in fundamentals of optics and photonics. He was a PhD student of Serge Haroche and is now professor at the Humboldt University in Berlin. This group works with glass fibers having a diameter smaller than the wavelengths of the guided light. The special properties of these glass fibers make them suitable for using them as a quantum laboratory. Arno, please take now over and you all in front of the green screens enjoy this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulrich, for the kind introduction. And also from my side, a very warm welcome to all the viewers. Oh, there are so many of you. I'm sure this will not only get my adrenaline pumping. So it's really a great pleasure and honor for me to chair this round table both the occasion and the guests are exquisite. 
and I'm really looking forward to an exciting and lively discussion. So without any further ado, let me introduce tonight's guests and let me start with Doris Reiter. Doris Reiter is a group leader and theoretical physicist at the Technical University of Dortmund, and uh, she is investigating the interaction of light and matter at the nanoscale and nanostructures like quantum dots. Her research contributes to the understanding, but also to the design and optimization of future quantum light sources for quantum technologies. Welcome, Doris. Our next distinguished guest is Serge Charoche. Serge Charoche is Professor Emeritus at the Collège de France and one of the founders of the field of cavity quantum electrodynamics. By means of conceptually simple experiments, he shed light on the foundations of quantum physics and also enabled proof of principle realizations of the processing of quantum information. Together with Dave Weinland, he was awarded the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physics for the measurement and manipulation of individual quantum systems. Welcome, Serge. Mm -hmm. And last, but certainly not least, Anton Seilinger. Anton Seilinger is the president of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. He is professor emeritus at the University of Vienna and a senior scientist at the Institute of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information in Vienna. He is certainly known to most of you for his spectacular experiments on the quantum teleportation of photons and also for his recent work on the application of quantum physics in the context of quantum communication and quantum information processing. But beyond that, he also made numerous contributions regarding the foundations of quantum physics. His work and earned him countless academic honors and awards, like, for example, the Isaac Newton Medal and the Wolf Prize in Physics. Welcome, Anton. So to get this round table discussion going, what I would like to do is to have our guests give the first round of statements in which they can share their passion for their research and for quantum physics in general with us. Um, for that purpose, I wait for each of you. And um, Doris is first. So let me share the slide. and ask Doris to um, tell us what we see here and what it has to do with your research and why you are excited about it, please. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Anna, for the really um, nice introduction and also a very warm welcome from my side to the audience to celebrate quantum science and technology. Um, what do you see on the slide was the first question. And you see actually a quantum dot emitting entangled photons. Let me briefly explain to you what that means. In uh, the second quantum revolution, which we are really like, which is happening right now, we want to have quantum technologies. And one pillar of that second quantum revolution is quantum communications. So we need photons, which are in a special state. That means in a single photon state or in a tangled state or in much more complex states. And I guess my colleagues will talk more about that in a minute. How do we get these photon states? So this is um, a question like which has been answered, but now we do not only want to get the photon states, but we, we want to get them on demand. We want to have them like really being all the same. We want them efficiently. There are like many demands. We want to have them if we want to go to, to the technology market. And here you see the quantum dot, which is like a, a two or 10 nanometer sized object. And I really like that picture because you see it's a solid state object. It means it's built up of like 10 to the four, like 10,000 atoms or maybe 100,000 atoms. So it's not a single atom giving you the photons, 
but like an ensemble of like, not an ensemble, but like a structured, um, well, quantum dot, a structured array of atoms. Um, these quantum dots are really like one of the prominent um, platforms to give entangled photons to us for the quantum technologies. And what I'm researching is how to really make them as efficient as possible. And that means like having them like perfectly coming. And that means I need to understand the details. And now I think Arno is just like switched out. So I just keep going and I'm saying like why I'm excited about quantum technologies. And I'm excited because first of all, it's going to be a technology we're all going to use someday, maybe, or maybe just some of us are going to use it. And uh, this gets me excited and along like of developing that technology, we also stumble up on new effects we haven't thought about. And this is really getting me like uh, wanting to do more in the field. <laughs> so Anu, are you back? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Doris. Um, I am back and I um, hope that my connection will work from now on and will now switch to the next slide, which uh, I prepared for Serge Aroche. And uh, Serge, could you share with us uh, your thoughts on what we see here and why uh, a cat is relevant for today's quantum technologies. Okay, so first of all, good evening, and I'm very pleased to attend to this uh, session. And I am like the young people, uh, very much uh, excited about the future of, uh, of quantum science, quantum physics. And I think it's uh, what is really exciting is that we have a very strong connection between fundamental science, between the science which try to understand deeper and deeper the basis of, of the world around us and applications and technological applications. Now the Schrodinger cat problem is of course a very old story that most of you know about. It's related to, I think the most fundamental aspect uh, properties of quantum system is the superposition principle. The fact that uh, an atom or a photon can exist simultaneously in different states, giving rise to interference effects. And uh, this is true. This, this property is the cause of entanglement. It's because of superposition that when you have a system made of different parts, like the two photons, which were discussed before, you get this strange property of entanglement. So uh, Schrodinger asked this question back in the 1930s, the big question, which was very puzzling, is the fact that you get superpositions in microscopic system in atoms, in, in photons, but you don't see them in the microscopic world around us. For example, he took the example of a cat, which was very provocative, but as soon as you put thousands of atoms or molecules together, you lose very quickly these superpositions. So about uh, 25 or 30 years ago, at the time that uh, Arnaud, you were working with us in Paris, uh, we had the idea to use the, the, the possibilities of cavity quantum electrodynamics to test experimentally the system. We, had, we, we could put an atom in a cavity and couple the atom so strongly to the cavity that we could control with a single atom a field made of several many photons. And the idea was to try by this interaction to prepare the field in the cavity in a superposition of two states which had classically distinct properties, for example, two different phases, and observe how the system very quickly became classical, lost this quantumness because of what is called decoherence, which is the coupling to the environment. So this is a fundamental aspect. And uh, Anton also worked very much on this issue by, by trying to see interferences of bigger and bigger objects in the young double slit experiment, for instance. And, in all the system, you, you come to the point that at, at some point, because of the coupling to the environment, the quantumness is lost. And this is a very important issue if you want to use uh, to, to build larger and larger system, for instance, to, to build a quantum computer or to build a system which will be able to uh, make ad take advantage of this superposition principle at a large scale. So. Uh, what is interesting is that you can use cat systems like Schrodinger cat states 
entangled state of photons in cavities in order to try to preserve coherence for longer times because these systems can be controlled and you can look at the system in such a way that you can uh, observe when decoherence occurs and try to correct for it. And in the field of circuit QED, which is very similar to cavity QED, but uh, working with superconducting devices, Schrodinger cat states have been studied, which can uh, uh, store quantum information for long, for much uh, longer times that we can do in other systems and try to use the property of the Schrodinger cat system to make what is called quantum error correction. So this is a, this field has been developing very fast during the last years. And uh, uh, there are some startup companies which are working on the system trying to, to protect quantum systems from decoherence. So again, what I want to emphasize is the fact that fundamental physics is very strongly and very deeply linked to possible applications in the future. Uh, we are, I, I talked here about uh, quantum information. I, I want to emphasize that there is another area which has been developing in a fantastic way during the last, let's say, 20 years. This is the domain of atomic clocks and optical clocks, which have been one of the pioneers was, was David Wineland, which, uh, uh, who was uh, quoted by Arno earlier. Now these clocks have precision which is absolutely fantastic there with atomic clocks with optical atomic clocks one can check uh, general relativity effects uh, the difference uh, of the uh, uh, times by two clocks which are separated by only one millimeter uh, of altitude in the, in the gravitational field of the earth this is absolutely unbelievable it's it's five or six orders of magnitude more precise than the clocks which are used in the gps system today and I'm sure that there will be application of this in fundamental physics to test, for instance, general relativity or, or the stability of fundamental constants and also for possible application in the future. And uh, I, I really wish that I would be able to witness uh, what happens in the years to come. And uh, it's, it's really very exciting. Thank you. I think I will stop at this point. Thank you very much, Serge, for this first statement. And I would like to take the opportunity here to draw the viewers' attention to the questions and answers tool. So you are invited to enter your questions there. And uh, later on in the discussions, I will read out your questions and our guests will have the opportunity to answer them. Thank you. So um, with this, let me come to the uh, last slide, which is uh, actually the one for Anton Seilinger. Let me share it. So Anton, uh, what do we see here? And by what means can we expect that quantum physics will revolutionize today's communication? I don't, now you can hear yeah, me. Yes. I was wondering which picture you will be showing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have the one about quantum uh, communication. But before we go into this discussion, I'm, I, I, might, I would like to say something more general. And that is when as a young student, I first learned about quantum physics. Uh, 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 essentially from books. I learned it from books. One of the books was the famous book by Claude Coentanucci about, about quantum physics, but also others, I picked them. I was immediately, I was immediately shocked by the immense mathematical beauty of that, of that theory. It's absolutely incredible. And I'm always sorry that, that to understand this beauty, you have to know at least some mathematics. Uh, I think everybody, everybody should know how, how fantastically beautiful it is. The second point I want to remark is, is that this is probably the theory which is best confirmed in, by observation, by experiments, to numerous digits, you know, like the anomalous uh, 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 magnetic moment of the electron and many other things. It's unbelievable how well it is confirmed. And the third point, which I 
realized already then, and which is still still interesting, is the question: What does it tell us besides so being so beautiful and mathematical and everything I described described about the world? And there we have still open questions, which are which are fascinating and interesting. Some of them can be or could be answered by experiments. Uh, uh, one of the one of the uh, beautiful theoretical predictions has been uh, mentioned already by Troy's and Serge's entanglement, and this entanglement uh, uh, is the the uh, is the simple fact that you can have two systems which can be where, where all the measurements you observe can be perfectly correlated. So when you ask them, "Are you spin up?" and it says yes. Then the other one you definitely know will also say spin up. If it says spin down, the other one will definitely also say spin down. And everyone in his right mind would say, oh, this is because they have been born identical. And it turns out, this was shown to us by John Bell, that that is wrong. So we have perfect correlations, fantastic correlations, which cannot be explained by properties of the systems prior to and independent of measurement locally. A local local properties here. Okay, uh, the second one. Uh, uh, maybe I now go into 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 the discussion of this experiment. That's uh, uh, the the uh, quantum communication uh, with the satellite uh, Meteos. Uh, it's a Chinese project. I have to say we only collaborated on the on the link to to Europe. Uh, what you do in that experiment is you use quantum cryptography, in that case, not entanglement, but just individual uh, 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 quanta uh, is, is uh, uh, proposed by Bennett and Parsar a long time ago, uh, where you establish a secret key. So what happens is the satellite flies above China, establishes a secret key, a key with which you, which you can later use for, for encrypting information, and then it flies over, in that case, Austria, Graz, establishes a key. And then by combining the two, you can establish, uh, you can establish a secure link between, uh, uh, in that case, Graz and, and uh, in China, uh, uh, Beijing, uh, which, whose security is, as we like to say, a physicist, and no one has to be cautious. But by as far as we know, this is guaranteed by the laws of nature. As long as the two parties participating don't make mistakes. Uh, now this was this was a, a, a beautiful experiment, and we were able at, at that time to show that we can even uh, transfer some video messages and so on and so on. And I understand the project on the side of our Chinese friends is progressing nicely, and we plan to do some further experiments in the future. I would say that quantum. Uh, uh, cryptography is probably the uh, uh, furthest in terms of applications of the of the uh, various quantum technologies, and there are various plans all over the world to establish secure links. In some some projects are so ambitious to say that they want to connect, be able to connect every place on Earth with every other place on Earth. Uh, having said this. Uh, and ex having explained a little bit uh, 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 quantum entanglement, another issue I would like to go into is the Cochrane Specker theory. But maybe I do that later. I don't know. I leave it up to you, Arno, uh, because this is, in my eyes, as deep as Bell theorem. Those are very important in the foundations. So, in, in, indeed, maybe this would be a good um, topic in in uh, the later interactive discussion. Thank you, Anton. And um, with this, let me stop uh, sharing the slide. Okay, and then um, I would like to come back to this uh, slogan that developed in the preparation of the celebration of uh, the 100 years, 100th anniversary uh, of the creation of quantum physics, which is 100 years of quantum is just the beginners, be the beginning. Um, I think it would be wonderful if uh, here in this discussion, 
we could give our viewers a flavor of what happened, where we are, and what future impact quantum physics will have. And um, in this context, one often hears, and Doris already mentioned this term, that we are witnessing the second quantum revolution. And to better understand what is happening, uh, it would be great if we could sketch how quantum physics developed from a theory that was made to describe atoms and the microscopic world to uh, some enabling uh, theory which uh, allowed us to develop the technologies that now uh, drive our modern information society in what is called the first quantum revolution. And also what is more about the second quantum revolution than this first quantum revolution. Um, Anton, maybe you would just like to continue, but there's Serge who's... I can... Yeah, Serge? Yeah. Oh, uh, for, go ahead. To, to, to go on to continue about what uh, Anton said, I think maybe one amazing thing about quantum physics is that the principles were laid, uh, were just established back in the 1920s, as we are celebrating now the 100th anniversary. And uh, they were right. Heisenberg, Bohr, Einstein, Schrodinger were able to put forward these ideas, which were very, very puzzling, very difficult to accept. But they were forced to do that by just by the, the power of their minds, by the fact that they had to understand what was happening at the microscopic level. They imagined what, they, what was called thought experiments, experiments of the mind, which were not possible to do at that time. But just by the logical implication of the thought experiments, they came to the idea of state superposition, of entanglement, of non-locality. There was a famous uh, paper by Einstein in the 1930s where he discussed this uh, entanglement properties. He did not like it, but he was forced to accept it. And I think there, this aspect, this psychological aspect of quantum physics, historical and psychological is very interesting and it says a lot about the way science is evolving. Now, when you, when you talk about uh, quantum revolution, of course, the first quantum revolution was absolutely un unbelievable. All the technologies we are using today, I am not talking about the second quantum revolution, the lasers, the GPS, uh, MRI, imaging, uh, and all, uh, the computers all come from the understanding of the microscopic world and would have been absolutely impossible without the knowledge of the world that we got from, from the quantum revolution. And I must add that the, the scientists who were working at that time, Einstein, Bohr, and the others never said they were doing a revolution. They just did it and it happened. And most of these applications came 20, 30 years after they had been predicted. For instance, we are. I think this year we could celebrate the uh, discovery of the Bose-Einstein condensation. It was in 1922 or 23 that Einstein had this idea and they had, we had to wait for 75 years before uh, Bose-Einstein condensation could be made in the lab, uh, uh, discover, uh, realized in the lab. And there is a lot of application of this, which uh, we could discuss later on. The laser also was predicted by Einstein in 1916 as a stimulated emission. It took 40 years before it, it became an instrument which you can use. I can say also that uh, NMR was discovered by Purcell and Bloch in 1945, but it took 30 years uh, until MRI could be developed, uh, as we know, to, to, to witness what happens inside our bodies. And it, it, there is a time lag between the fundamental science and the applications. And I guess we could say that about the future applications of uh, what we call now the second quantum revolution, what we are doing today in the lab, we may have very important and unpredict unpredictable application in the future in 20 or 30 years from now. So I think we have to be careful, first of all, because our imagination cannot be as rich as what happens really when we do research. And second, because we should not sell, oversell what we are doing today. It's beautiful enough not to need any overselling. But I, I agree, the beauty of this comes from, from the mathematical beauty and simplicity of this, of this physics. And I, I fully agree with Anton with what he said about, 
uh, about uh, the reason why he's 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 uh, wondering about about this physics. It's really amazing what what the quantum ideas have brought to us and what they will still uh, what we are still uh, be witnessing in the future. Thank you, Serge. So, uh, any more comments on what actually makes the difference between the first quantum revolution and this now ongoing second quantum revolution? Uh, maybe, quantum? maybe, maybe a comment about revolutions. Yes. <laughs> uh, 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 I, I fully agree with Serge that that uh, uh, it is an essence of this. Uh, 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 very fundamental in our case experiments that you have no idea when you started what this will be leading to. When we started our first interference experiments with neutrons, you know, over, uh, 40 years ago or something like that, or 50, even 50 years ago, my God, time flies, yeah, 50 years ago, when journalists asked me what this is good for, I told them, you know, a little bit provocant, you know, I can be prov provocative. I told them, I have to, I tell you proudly, this is good for nothing. This will never be used for anything, you know. We just do it because we are curious and we want to know if nature is really so strange, strange as, as, as the theory tells us, you know. Well, we were wrong, okay. Some things are developing. And I also share, share Serge's viewpoint. We should not oversell whatever applications should, could come in the future. Here again, probably our fantasy is too limited in both ways. In, the, uh, in both ways, both in, in that, we, that we today think uh, about applications we might not turn out the way we, we are thinking, and maybe also in the other way, that some things come where we, where we, which we don't expect. Uh, this is pretty sure, you know, whatever, whatever will happen. You know, no, I'm, I, 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 I like to say I would be very, very surprised if the future would not surprise me. You know, so it happens. It happens that this really too. On surprise, I would like to say one little comment, and that is Einstein in uh, in 1905 wrote his paper where he uh, uh, explained the the uh, introduced the quantum uh, of the of the flight, the fo today called the photon. Okay, and about that paper, it actually Einstein writes. Uh, to his friend, uh, 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 he had a small uh, uh, cap of uh, 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 friends. Uh, he wrote, uh, 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 this is a very revolutionary idea. And to the best of my knowledge, and I asked many historians, this is the only paper which Einstein called revolutionary. Now, now I would say, I would add something to that, to, on the reception of ideas. Uh, uh, Einstein was 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 as you as you uh, certainly know you are at the Humboldt University. He was in Berlin. He was professor at Humboldt, and he also became a, a, a paid professor at the Prussian Academy of Sciences. And in the letter of recommendation for Einstein, it says that that uh, science, for example, by Planck. And, and Rubens, who did the experiments on black body radiation, it says that the fact that in some cases he went too far, like in the invention of the photon, part of light should not be held against him because sometimes you have to go too far with your fantasy. This was about 1910, 1914, something like that. And what's fascinating is that for exactly that idea, Einstein received the, 20, uh, the 1922 Nobel Prize in Physics. And this is what I love so much about physics, that you have a judge, a judge, namely nature. You ask experiment, and nature tells you whether your ideas, whether crazy or not, doesn't matter. Whether the nature behaves like that, and this is a big advantage uh, over, over, for example, humanities and so on, that this really exists. And in the same way, I hope we will, we will be, we will be, again, uh, changing our mind in the future in fundamental ways. Yeah, but about changing actually our perception and our mind, I would like to ask a question uh, in that context and to Doris, uh, since you say were bred as a physicist during the second quantum revolution, would you think that it altered the perception of quantum physics 
what is your take? Is, is quantum mechanics an engineering tool? Do we uh, just accept that quantum mechanic works? And then to Serge and Anton, what about foundations and implications in that case? So uh, thanks uh, for the question. Uh, I, would, I would like first put a comment on the um, applications because like my colleagues have discussed that, that we don't know what's going to come. Uh, while I fully agree on we don't know what's going to come, very many, I, my, I myself and my colleagues were working very closely now with industry. So we actually do know what's going to come very soonish. I feel that gap has like uh, closed quite quickly. People are going to have startups right now making money out of quantum technology. And I would say that's an application to me. So we, we really go out of the like fundamental things to go into making money, which I would say uh, is going into the real world in, in sense of an application. So this is uh, something I would say like quantum computers are built by companies now. We have uh, like quantum detectors, quantum sensors, which are really built and, and like sold. Um, what more do we want from an application? And I'm pretty sure, I fully agree with you, there will be many more applications we cannot envision right now. So, so this is like the first thing I wanted to say. And now like, as I said, like yours, like I'm growing up with quantum mechanics. Um, I still can be astonished by quantum mechanics. Sometimes it's like, I just accept like, yeah, this is how it works. This is how it's supposed to do. I had to like, just do my exercises, calculate it, know how to do that. And sometimes you sit down and think like, yeah, actually what does it imply? And that sometimes still makes me wonder. So it's, it's both of that, it's going to the application and still sometimes wondering what is nature actually doing there and, and why is it doing that? I feel there are some concepts uh, which are quite um, interesting what to think about, like the superposition principle, true randomness. This is something which is hard to grasp as a concept. As the mathematicians have their infinity, I think we have sometimes quantum mechanics. So it's, it's, it's both doing, doing work with it, seeing it works. I, I feel more accepting probably that it works probably than back in the days. And because we see it works, we can do stuff with it. It's just like you calculate it, you go to the to the experimental colleagues and they measure it. This is like, for me, it's always the biggest thing when, when I propose something and then they measure it. It's like, wow, <laughs> yay, that happened. And still sometimes wondering what's what's happening around. Yeah, as you as you said, one thing that is really hard to grasp, I guess, is this lack of determinism in common interpretations of quantum mechanics. So the, the fact that there's absolutely no way of predicting the outcome of a single given measurements in general, right? So, and, and um, I wonder, I mean, it's a question to maybe all of you. I mean, do you feel comfortable with it? And, and I mean, are alternative interpretations like, many worlds, for example, where there is determinism more satisfying? And what is your general take on alternative interpretations that essentially just reproduce the results of quantum mechanics quantitatively, but give you a maybe more satisfying view on the world? I, I, I think I, I agree with the fact that the way we see quantum physics depends very much of your state of mind. When you are just diving into an experiment, you, you just apply the principle, you don't ask too many questions. When you start asking questions about undeterminism, about the collapse of the wave function, things like that, at some time you might feel uncomfortable. But the alternative explanation that you are mentioning, as you said, are reproducing exactly the same result. And as long as you cannot imagine an experiment which would tell you which interpretation is the right one and which is, is not, it, it's just a game. I, I want to mention that th there is another frontier which is not just a, a matter of interpretation, and which is still open, which is the fact that quantum mechanics does not uh, fit well with general, does not fit at all with general relativity. And it's amazing to think that these two ideas which were born in Einstein's mind at the beginning of the last century, quantum physics with the 1905 paper and the wave particle dualism and general relativity are still standing, each of them with a fantastic precision in their domain of application. 
uh, Anton mentioned the fact that you can predict the magnetic moment of the electron with 10 significant digits. I think Feynman said some, at some point that if you could, if uh, the distance between Paris and New York could be calculated by quantum electrodynamics, it, it would be right within the, 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 the thickness of a hair. And, and six, this is what 10 significant digits means. And general relativity also is, is, is proven accurate with a fantastic uh, precision. And yet, when you think of what happens in a black hole, for instance, or in the vicinity of a black hole, there is no way to understand what's going on because there is a kind of uh, inconsistency between quantum physics and general relativity. And I think we, this is not, this has nothing to do with applications. This is really fundamental physics. And we need a new Einstein to understand that, I think. Einstein had tried, but he, uh, he, he failed and he, because he, he was not, he did not know enough about high energy particle physics and so on. But we, we still need to understand this link. And this, this is why cosmology and quantum physics are so closely linked. And I think this is, if I, I don't know anything in details about that, but I think it's the, the most fascinating and the most challenging problem that quantum physics is, is uh, raising at this time. What I, also I wanted to make a, a remark about uh, the, the fact that we, we have applications of the second quantum revolution. I agree that there is a lot of uh, progress now is that the startup companies are, are making money, which is not a proof that quantum <laughs> physics uh, will be successful in application. It proves that some people are, are able to, uh, to raise money and to make money. But I agree that uh, in the domain, for example, of probes, quantum probes, metrology using quantum physics, and, and again, the problem of atomic clocks also, which use quantum principles now, atomic clocks are using, are starting to use entanglement and squeeze states to improve the precision that their application. But these applications are still uh, kind of small niches which, which uh, are useful for physicists. And uh, if you think about application like the laser or the computer, uh, it's, the future is still open. It's, it's not clear that we'll have quantum computers which will replace uh, classical computers. It is not clear that we'd have uh, an instrument which will be so widely used that the lasers are now in all kinds of domains. And I'm sure this will happen, but it's still open. Uh, can I say a little about randomness? If you, yes. you know, for, for me, for me, a world where you have, you know, uh, uh, actually Heisenberg already distinguished between what he called objective randomness and subjective randomness. Subjective randomness is, is, for example, the randomness when you throw a die or when you play roulette. There, unless quantum laws come in, but there, uh, when we can assume that all is within the validity of classical mechanics, in principle, it is determined what will be the result. This is subjective randomness because, as Heisenberg says, I, as a subject, don't have all information or maybe cannot even have all information. Uh, objective randomness is where, where this uh, uh, information does not exist at all, where there is no way, no matter how close you look and so on, that you can explain. Uh, for example, uh, uh, when you have a famous uh, double slit pattern where an individual particle will land. Okay? Uh, uh, now, this to me is a much more, is a worldview which I like much more than the deterministic world. To me, a deterministic world would be frightening. But everything is predetermined. Absolutely. You know, how boring, how uninteresting. If it's open, if it's randomness, there's a lot of more possibility. Sure, in both ways, maybe, you know, you don't like some of this randomness, but it's, to me, this randomness of, of, of individual events is probably one of the conceptually deepest insights in, in the 20th century. And I'm not sure whether there is something more to understand or not, whether we, the world is just like that, I have no idea. Uh, this depends on whether somebody ever has a deeper insight. Maybe also the, the, the new Einstein, which was 
<lacht> Menschen bei Serge, you know, maybe somebody. And uh, I hope I'm still alive when you, when many young people discover uh, uh, new, 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 really fundamental things. Uh, this is this is my this is my my greatest hope in terms of physics. So, so since Serge already uh, hinted on the amazing precision with which you can actually predict, for example, the transition of an, the transition frequency of an atom, and the fact that this already in the first quantum revolution gave rise to amazingly stable and precise frequency standards and time standards. Uh, as you said, Serge, the second quantum revolution using entanglement, using squeezed states makes these clocks even more precise. And I think um, one thing that will be maybe hard to grasp for somebody who is not into uh, quantum physics and metrology is why do actually 18 or more digits matter? I mean, what, what can we do if we are able to measure time or frequency that precisely? It's a question to all of you. I, I want first to say that 14 digits, that is a, ten, a precision of 10 minus 14 per day, which is the clocks of the GPS, uh, is very useful. This is why the GPS works. If you did not have this kind of precision, you would not be able to localize yourself at the surface of the Earth within a couple of meters. But now with the new clocks, it could be millimeters. And the question you are asking is why it would be useful to be able to get a precision of, of the order of millimeters or microns. And there, there are many, uh, we might discuss that. I think there will be applications of that. Well, maybe also about fundamental research. I mean, if we are able to, to measure the predictions or check the predictions with that precision, we may be able to go beyond quantum mechanics, right? If we see a violation at that level. Yeah, yeah there, there are experiments now which are trying to find if the fundamental constants are changing with time, which is connection with cosmology. And now these new clocks are of course uh, the best candidates to test these, these ideas. And, and um, I think experiments are going on now. For the time being, one has put only limits. Uh, uh, no variation of the fundamental constant has been seen yet, but the precision with an increased precision, nobody knows what will happen. And this might have some relevance to the question that I was asking, because it, it will connect quantum physics with cosmology and we need data, we need experiments to, to, to proceed in this direction. Uh, can I add on that? Because well, mm -hmm. like for me, what is always super interesting is because I come from a solid state background is the precision we can control matter by now. Because we, we started off, of course, it's super interesting to connect to like fundamental questions, but like having the ability we have uh, to how, how we can control matter on the nanoscale. We can do like new materials. We can like put atoms actually where we want them to be on, on such a precise scale. It's a different way of precision we're talking about than the clock precision, but the scale precision is also has increased a lot. And for me, when I first saw like the atoms being placed in a ring on a surface, that was like, wow, this is possible. And on, on such a tiny, not only uh, time length scale, but also on the like length scale, like the meter length scale. I, I feel this is also something we could even be more precise and understand what's happening in all the matter which is around us. Yeah, th th this is really beautiful. And it's also, what is beautiful in this is also that it connects different fields of physics. Atomic physicists are doing that with very ultra cold matter. They can put atoms in, in a lattice and in their experiments, the atoms are separated by micrometers. In condensed matter, they are separated by angstroms. So the scale is completely different, but the physics is the same. And yeah. you can simulate with cold atoms situations which happen at a quite different scale in condensed matter physics. And the two fields are fertilizing each other, are, are, are challenging each other. And this is one aspect that I have seen developing during my career. Uh, when I started the... 40 or 50 years ago, condensed matter physics and atomic physics were completely separated. And now they, they share the same concepts and the same idea. And I think this is also fascinating. 
So um, if if we now ask ourselves how to go further, I mean, how can we find physics beyond the standard description? Then it's almost discouraging, right? Because for the last 100 years, quantum mechanics made quantitatively correct predictions. So what I would like to ask all of you is, what would you say, where should we look to disprove quantum mechanics? We already said, uh, maybe it's in the 18th digit, but are there other ways? Why do you want to disprove quantum mechanics? It's so beautiful, as Anton Feilinger pointed out. I really like to, to stay with it, to be honest. Let, let, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because my daughter told me the other day, you know, I have a hard time imagining that in 10,000 years there will be museums about us saying how stupid we were and analyzing why we didn't get the truth, you know? And, I mean, we, it, it is, I mean, we, we, it is quite likely that quantum mechanics is not the end of the story. Maybe it is, but um, maybe it's not. And then the question is where to look. Well, well can I say something about that? At yes. first, as you know, you know, with my, with my people over many years, I have done a number of experiments where we, I would not say tested, but verified fundamental predictions of quantum mechanics uh, uh, with, you know, sometimes we were lucky to be the first one, sometimes it was more precise than before and so on. And I still remember, you know, many years ago when we did the, the double slit experiments with neutrons, you know, two slits and you see the beautiful diffraction pattern and we saw the, the pattern agreed with, you know, simplest quantum mechanics, you know, to very high precision. And I gave talks at, you know, some famous universities that I showed the pattern. And, you know, and very well-known famous physics colleagues came after, uh, to me afterwards and said, it really works that way with one neutron at a time. And you really get that pattern. And I said, what else did you expect? This is exactly what theory told us, you know? So what I want to say here is that all these, many of these fundamental, or all of these fundamental experiments changed our mind in some way. We are more open to think about these things. And this is also very important for the, for the whole quantum, quantum technology development, you know? It's not, entanglement is not a curiosity anymore. Uh, it's something which you use as tools. It's still curious, absolutely, but you don't have to worry about this curiosity. And, about, and the, the, the point about future theories, there have been various different ways how new theories developed. Uh, one of them, which is actually a, a rare, is disagreement with experiments. Uh, some of the deepest new developments were when people unified concepts which were before considered separate, like Einstein, like, like uh, uh, Newton. He unified the concept of the fall of an apple on Earth and the motion of, of the moon around the, around the Earth, which was considered something completely separate. And he showed it's the same thing. Or, or just another famous example is, is Maxwell, is, is uh, electro, electrodynamics. You know, he showed that electricity and mag magnetism are the same and so on. And maybe we are overlooking something in that respect at present in our beautiful theories. Maybe it's like that. And experiments can help. Experiments can help. To, to, I mean, I mean they, 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 your, 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 your question is, is certainly, an, as you are aware, an unanswerable question <laughs> because we cannot predict the unpredictable. But yeah. we have to keep our minds open. Yeah. But, but saying like to the question, where shall we look? I think you answered that beautifully. Probably we should look at the cross section of diff different physics disciplines right now. Because that's a good, it, that's... It's, it's like not the, as, as, as Sergio Roche mentioned, now like the, the, the atom optics and the solid state community are talking. Maybe we have the cosmology uh, physicists to bring in and, and just like see like how you, 
like different worlds, physics worlds collide in their theories and, and make them overlap. This is, I, I feel like when we exchange from these different viewpoints, this is how we have to look. And, and at some point, maybe something will not be right. I think that has to be the trigger to find something new at some yeah. point. Yeah, I, I want to. It will be like that. Or we will knock our head and say, oh my God, why, why, could we, why did we overlook that, you know? <laughs> I, I can make a comment about something that Arno said. He asked the question, are, you, are we going to find something in the 15 or 16 digit? I think there is a competition now to understand these issues between precision and brute force. Brute force is accelerator physics. And if you want to find out new particles, you have to build accelerators which are bigger and bigger in size. And we are now confronted with the fact that we cannot exceed the, the size of the Earth for our accelerators. On the other hand, if you reach the 20th digit, as we as people are doing now in atomic physics, you can find hints of new physics because virtual particles can be created and can affect the energy levels of atoms if you measure with this kind of precision. So you can, you can see things and you can have a hint at things which are out of reach with brute force physics. And I think particle physics is in a crisis because of the fact that it's very difficult to get to larger sizes because it, even if you build a new accelerator, it will take 20 or 30 years before it is built and students cannot wait for that time to, to get results. So uh, I think the physics we are doing at, at the humane scale has this big advantage that we can go in one direction, which is precision, which costs much less and which is more feasible than going to brute force physics. But, maybe, but whether we will find something new or not, I think it's open. I don't know. Yeah, but, but can, sorry, sorry, guys. Yeah, sorry. I, I wanted to say like maybe just also a very simple like thing how to discover new physics is just doing physics. Because I feel just to stumble sometimes upon something and then you get something new. So this is so unpredictable. You sometimes find something where you never looked, and, and if it's a small thing, maybe not a big step, but it's just doing and exchanging. This is always works for me. Yeah. Uh, I would like I would like to add a little bit to what what Serge said. One of the beauties of our field is that people can work in small groups. You have an experiment where you have. You know, maybe sometimes only two people, sometimes three, four, five. In exceptional cases, it's more, but these are the exceptions. So, and this is this is an advertisement now, you know, for all the young people listening. This is an optimal field to work in, you know, because you really can do everything with your own hands, you know. You don't have to believe, for example, there are stars and so on. And it's extremely motivating. That already... Uh covered my next point, which was I wanted you to give a recommendation to a bright PhD student who is seeking a topic for the PhD to undertake. Um, but then maybe um, one last question before we uh, switch to the questions from the audience. And let me remind you that you can actually put questions into the questions and answers uh, tool, okay? Um, so what I wanted uh, to ask you is your um, prediction on whether quantum technology will actually enter our everyday life like electronics and photonics did after the first quantum revolution. Can I, can I make a fun comment on that? Yes. Because I think uh, in some sense, quantum technology enters at least our creative life in the sense if you go to like a movie, if you read a book, you really can now see that the creative people picked up quantum technologies. I wanted to say that already to this multiverse theory idea. Um, I feel like this is already a big step forward that, that you can really go now in, into a movie and see like, oh, someone talks about quantum technology, maybe not in the way we would talk about it as a physicist, but I think this is already something going into an everyday person. If, if to answer to your second, uh, like more seriously, will we have a tool like our smartphone, which has a quantum, which is a quantum device, 
probably it has a quantum component. This would be my guess, but this is future oracling and I can't do that either. I guess all my colleagues will say like, yeah, it's going to happen because they want to get funding for it right now. But I guess like a tool will be it, something. Any more comments on this? I think it's difficult to separate what is new and old quantum. If you look at the, at the cell phone, there is a lot of quantum physics in it already. So what do you mean by new uh, uh, second quantum revolution would be ex uh, devices which explicitly use the manipulation of quantum systems yeah. in, a, in a deterministic way. And as I said before, I think I don't know. I, I am I, I'm sure it's a fascinating field, but whether there will be an application which will be overwhelming, like the one we, we, we quoted before, like the laser or the classical computer, this, this I don't know. But when you make prediction of this kind, you, uh, you always make mistake. And since we are recorded, I think it's better not to make too many predictions. <laughs> <laughs> this, the, this famous prediction by, I think, to the president of IBM in the 1940s, who said that there were in the world they used for four or five computers. So I, I think <laughs> the kind of things that we should not see. And, but he was correct at that time. For the computers which were built at that time, he was correct. Because there were such monsters and so on that you could only use them and pay them through, through you know, military, military money. You know? uh, this is, um, talking about that, it's amazing to think that the, the computer which controlled the Apollo missions 50 years ago were much less powerful than what we have in a cell phone today. And, and they were right. able to okay. do that at that time. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, it, it, since now questions are coming in at a higher rate, uh, maybe we should really open the discussion for the remaining time uh, to the audience. And uh, it turns out that the first two questions uh, are on the same topic. So it's the question about the quantum measurement problem. So the first question, which almost is the same as the second, is do you see the chance for a physical settlement of the quantum measurement problem and in turn another possible quantum technology revolution or would you expect it to stay in the realm of philosophy? My answer is neither. <laughs> <laughs> neither. Okay. <laughs> I would like to quote, I would like to quote here again, one of my favorites, namely Heisenberg, who said something like, you know, you have to look it up more precisely now, uh, who said something like that the measurement problem is not a physical problem. Uh, it's a, he said, uh, you know, what does the measurement mean? It means that we do a measurement and we change the information which we have about the system, namely the quantum state. And he said, what would be more natural than changing the representation of our information uh, 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 if you have obtained new information? Yeah. So to, to me, the problem is not a problem. This is my, per uh, this is my personal problem. And it's not something in philosophy. It's, it's simply a fact that we update our information and we yeah. do a measurement. Yeah, yeah. But this implies randomness and everything is another part of the game. Yeah? Okay. No, I, I agree with, with, with Anton. In fact, in fact, the fact that you, uh, when you make a measurement, you update the information you know, it's called Bayes' law, and it's in classical physics. It's, and even in classical physics, it leads to paradoxical results. And when you ask some question, even to statisticians about very simple classical experiments, they make mistakes because they, we, right. we, it's difficult to have the intuition of the Same. fact that you change your vision of the world because you acquire classical information. So in quantum physics, in addition to that, you have, of course, a randomness problem, but uh, to call this a problem is more a question of non inadequation between the way the world works and the way you would like it to work. I think mm. that, Feynman did said something like that. A paradox is just a contradiction between what what you you think the the way nature should work and the way it really works. And if you ask the question, in, if you put the question in this way, there is no problem. But now, of course, uh, sometimes it's strange, nevertheless. And 
the, the way you see that depends very much on your state of mind. Right. So the next question that came in uh, was by uh, Dieter Meschede, who asked, what about the story of decoherence? Have we fully understood or is there something else? Is it worthwhile to keep investigating? Well, this, is more, this is not my field. <laughs> I, I think that uh, as a process which is, is related to entanglement with the environment, it's well understood and there is nothing outside quantum physics. Now the question whether uh, the superposition principle will hold in the macroscopic world is still an open question and experiments. Uh, I know that Anton has been thinking uh, and Penrose uh, have been thinking about experiments to do this kind of experiment and, and to try to see if there is a connection. This is one of Penrose's ideas, this is a connection with gravitation issue. Uh, it's still an open question, but I, I think the experiments are very, very difficult and I, I, don't, I don't see any, any result, uh, experimental result at, the, at this point. So this, uh, this is work not done by me anymore, like Markus Arndt and others uh, do this kind of work, but I personally don't cannot see any connection between gravitation and decoherence. It is just as you said, it's a, it's a dispersion of information through entanglement into the into the environment. And there are beautiful experiments where you can undo that actually. You can yeah. you can kind of get the information back from the environment and get it obtain coherence again and so on. So this to me in my eyes this is this is basically understood. I think there's still a very practical aspect to decoherence because when you think of having the quantum technology device, whatever it they may, you really not need to un like scrutinize it to get rid of it or make use of it, whatever it is. So how you define your quantum system and this is and, and how you like treat the environment is, is of I think I see it's an understood problem, but like getting the fine details of it is I'd say still something uh, we need to work on in that sense to, to really control our environment. And, and I feel many people are doing that right now. So I wouldn't say the qu question is that answered because we, we need to control it. That's yeah. if we want to make a device, that's important. Yeah, I'd it, say. yeah in, the, in the case of a quantum computer, it's, a big, it's called quantum error correction, the, the different methods that you can use to to witness decoherence and to correct for it, uh, and to keep the quantum to keep the quantum coherence in large system by exploiting entanglement and, uh, and putting an information into a big entangled system. So th there is a, there have been a lot of theoretical progress on this issue, but experimentally it's very very difficult because it's like dealing with a large environment. So that's, that's the problem is what is the, the largest system we can deal with in some sense, yeah. isn't it? Well, the issue is to keep a shot in the cat uh, half dead and half alive as long as possible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and this we need. This is why I say we need to understand how to do that. Maybe feed it with something. Yeah. Well, the cat has seven lives, right? How uh, I many? Yeah. Oh, you yeah, just revive it. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> right. Here's an interesting question. Um, so. What, what, which was also in line with the question I had prepared, which is what change in quantum physics do you expect in the next 10 years? So I would have asked if you had one wish, what would you like to see accomplished in the next 10 years? Hmm. I, I would, I, I like to say, you know, when to all this, uh, grants where you had to, to write down what you will do in the next three or four or five years. I always write, and if, in general, if this person in five years does what he or she proposes not to do, then she's probably not doing the uh, top work because the goals have to change. If you work on something, they have to change, they have to modify, right? What do I expect in... in in 10 years in terms of technology, I cannot, I cannot say, but I, I hope that we will see more experiments. And now I can mention Cochrane's Becker again, also in direction of the Cochrane's Becker theorem, meaning in terms of, of, of uh, 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 in situations where 
quantum systems really behave strangely different from what you classically expect. And so in Cochrane's paper, it's the, it's the fact that you can assi cannot assign properties to systems, even in, in, in situations where, where the observables commute, which means that they should be observable at the same time and so on. This is very interesting and, and there's still a lot to do. Something very practical I expect is having uh, some quantum, at least like you, you showed that in the very beginning at Anton Seilinger's slides that we have the connection between China and Austria. But I expect to have at least a small little quantum communication network within Germany, at least with the German Physical Society as so well. I have to say, I want, I want to see that probably across Europe, like people sending photons from here to you and you and you and stuff. Vienna. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so wherever we are at the moment. <laughs> I, I could uh, make, express two wishes, uh, which are very ambitious. I think if within 10 years we could have a quantum theory of gravity, it would be fantastic. And it will also be fantastic if it was simple enough for me to understand it. That's, uh, that's also something because uh, all what uh, all these string theories uh, or these uh, uh, gravity loop theories are very, very complicated mathematically. And uh, the beauty and simplicity of quantum physics that uh, Anton mentioned at the beginning uh, escapes me when I, when I look at these papers. I, I must confess I don't understand anything. And I am wondering whether there will be a truth which will be expressed in simple terms or whether it will become very, very complicated. And this is a very deep question because some people believe that the theory to be true has to be elegant and beautiful, but there is no proof that it is a requirement that nature works like that. So I don't know. Right. Can, can I add a, a small point, please? And that is, I am sometimes asked whether uh, quantum mechanics has something to do with consciousness, consciousness or with, with the brain. No, I have a fun answer. The fun answer is quantum mechanics is complicated. The brain is complicated. Therefore, the two must have to do with each other. You know, this is my fun answer. But seriously, this is a very deep question. It's a very deep question where the answer either way would be interesting. I personally believe Probably not, because this is an environment which leads to coherence immediately and so on. But who knows? Maybe nature surprises us. So this is, a, but I think two, 10 years is too short for that question. I think Serge's answer also answered another question on the kind of holy grail to be found in quantum physics, which is this unification. So maybe another question that has a quick answer, but still is of interest certainly to many. Does quantum entanglement transfer information? And if yes, does this information travel faster than light? And if no, how do the two states know what value to take? Well, so, the first answer the, may be it defines how you define it. It depends how you define information, but it cannot be used to transfer information alone without a classical channel in parallel. And therefore, it cannot send anything faster than speed of light. Uh, what was the last, last question again, the last part? How do the two states know what value to take? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to take this opportunity to raise an issue which I, I found very interesting about that. You, you cannot transfer information faster than light with entanglement, and even with non-relativistic entanglement. In fact, entanglement right. comes to non-relativistic quantum theory, right. and, it is, and, and in spite right. of the fact that you don't use Dirac equation, Schrodinger's equation, which is non-relativistic, and you cannot transfer faster than light, and in fact, the, the limit of, of the, the, the quality of cloning that you can achieve is limited by this uh, issue. If you could clone with an efficiency higher than 85%, you would transfer information faster than light. And it is impossible 
And in spite of that, you don't need relativity, relativity theory to, to show you can. I was not able to understand why. And I think there is a, a very deep question here, there. Yes, yes, can I add to that? This is really, this is really absolutely fascinating. Why, why is that the case? And, you know, if you look at multi-particle entanglement and just, just uh, uh, you know, the predictions of non-relativistic quantum mechanics for multi-particle entanglement, four, five, seven, or whatever measurements, the predictions are completely independent of the relative arrangement of the measurements in space and time. This is also something which absolutely fascinates me, and maybe it's connected to the question you just raised, uh, Serge. I, I, I don't know. It's quite interesting. So here's another short question, which maybe has a longer answer, which is, what is the current state of the art regarding quantum computers? They're very costly. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want one, you, you need to, to be very, very rich. <laughs> I guess like uh, the answer is uh, like, well, that's part of the answer, but um, I feel like the quantum computers, there was this uh, very famous 2019 paper, which said like, we have the quantum computer. Uh, we did something faster than everybody else is doing with the set normal computer. So and then another company said, oh, well, let's discuss the numbers again. Um, so what's actually the current state of the art is, is like many people are working on it very efficiently, but they haven't done like something super useful at the moment. So it's maybe steps they're doing. Let's wait what's what's coming up. I, I feel it's a very buzzing field. So, so following the papers, and I, I think there are too many to uh, summarize right now, it's really there is the prospect of having it and 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 really like the tiny ones are there and there seem to be fully quantum because we cannot look sometimes inside what particular companies are doing um it's it's coming smallly can we do it full size can we do something like a, a quantum simulation on that this is again oracling we cannot do we don't know what's coming to if we're like really going to scale it up to something really useful right, in the near future. So actually there's uh, two follow-up questions, even though I think that they, they are not related because the questions are not displayed, but here are questions on quantum computers. So one is maybe, uh, what is the connection between the quantum computer and the new upcoming financial system? So. This maybe sounds like a fun question, but uh, as we know, some uh, important inventions in physics also enabled faster trading. By the way, very precise atomic clocks maybe also help in that. So is there anything about the quantum computer that can help you trade better or faster? I've not thought of anything so far, but if we think of, I mean, like maybe trading, but we know that there are cryptocurrencies around, which take a lot of computation and effort. Not sure if anybody addressed that, if, if it can be done more efficient with a um, quantum computer. I, I'm not aware of any publication on that. I don't know if the others are. But... And, and then more back to the roots, what are the basic limitations to quantum computing? I mean, uh, theoretically or experimentally? <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess here it's really experiments. We, we have quantum computers and they're limited right now by, I guess, real life problems and not theory or, so let's talk about that. What is limiting currently quantum computing? I think the big limit is that we don't have a, we are not able, from what I understand, it's, it's it, uh, not yet been possible to have a single, to keep a single qubit in a quantum state forever. And this is what would be required to use a quantum computer for a general algorithm, to use algorithm to solve really problems 
uh, what people are doing now is having small machines. And I would call that a toy computer with a few tens of qubits, which are in, in, imperfect and trying to do things which you can do with this kind of machine. But the limit, but this is very far from the holy grail, which would be to, to be able to control completely decoherence. So, and, and I agree also with the fact that it's very hard to, to, to tell exactly where we stand because a lot of this research is being done in private companies, which do not publish everything uh, and which compete with each other. Uh, and this is a problem for basic science, I would, I would say. So here's one question from a student. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the very inspiring comments and opinions. As a student, I, as a student, I have just started to discover the quantum world, and I'm wondering, are the current big questions and next steps rather a question of controlling and making use of known properties of quantum systems? or discovering new theoretical foundations of quantum theory that will lead to new technologies? And if so, what are the greatest questions in that field that we struggle to understand so far? I would say both, actually. So there are big questions, as, as we heard today, and there are uh, the big question of making it uh, into technology, which, which are somehow go hand in hand but a little bit of different how you work on them. So if you want to go into technology, you, you not only have to consider um, how to make it work, but to make it work good and probably affordable or like repeatable and not breaking down after doing it once or twice because you want to use that. Um, so this is one set of questions which really goes on control. And the other big questions I think we heard about were like, not only like the fundamental uh, philosophical question, but like how to unify it with gravitational mm -hmm. theory. I think we, we mentioned some of these fundamental questions today. Okay, so I think that with this question from a student, um, I would like to close the discussion and uh, of course not before uh, thanking Doris Reiter, Sergei Roche and Anton Seidinger for sharing their views and insightful uh, discussion. And um, I would also like to thank um, Anja Metzeltin, Ulrich Bayer, and the staff of the German Physical Society for the organization and technical support. And then uh, I would, of course, most of all, thank the audience for the interest and very active participation uh, in the discussion. And uh, with this, I think I should share the thank you slide and um, say, take care. And Actually, um, how many how many people did we have in the audience? So uh, by now it has dropped to 183, but we were up to 250 okay. uh, during the and, during yeah. this. And thank you, Arno, for moderating this uh, this debate. It was very well done. Yeah, thank you. That was it was a pleasure to discuss with all of you. Yeah, it was a post big fun. Yeah. Thank you. And, and happy, I, Easter. happy Easter, everybody. Okay, you too. Good so, night. Good night. Okay, sir. then. Okay. Thank Bye. you very much thank again, you. and take care. Take care. Goodbye. Happy Easter. Holly, thank you. Thank you.